Today, we're very honored to have Harun Mokal to be joining us. He's unfortunately running a bit late because of traffic, <laughs> but he will be with us shortly. Now, with this much honor, I would like to call upon Musaidah, who would be reading a few verses of Quran from Surah Al-Fasad, inshallah. So welcome. Thank you. Thank 
you very much, uh, Mario and Seba, for your recitation and translation. Uh, at this point, we have uh, Efe, the president of the MIT MSA Center for Global uh, Thank you, Ron. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Awesome. Uh, uh, my name is Effa. I'm a junior at MIT, majoring in computer science and minor in political science. Um, first of all, thanks for coming today and being with us, being with MSA, and being part of this program. I would like to, uh, I don't want to keep it very long, but I would like to just tell a personal story, I think, that in some sense relates to the situation we are in right now with us. Uh, so it was, it was July 15th, I was at Google, uh, YouTube team, I was working some code, and I just wanted to give a little break. And I looked at my phone, and my friends were messaging me. Oh, like, did you see that? There are tanks around in Istanbul, um, like, blocking the ways. And I kind of like said, what's going on here? Like, that's, that's so weird, that doesn't happen. And I just turned back to my work, I was uh, writing code, then like 20, 30 minutes later, I opened my phone, there were like hundreds of WhatsApp messages. And I opened the news, uh, there were like, my, my uh, brother was stuck in somewhere, you know, people were saying what's gonna happen, there is this big uh, coup event going on, um, and that, that was like a really hard time. I felt very vulnerable at the, at the point. Everyone in Turkey, all people in Turkey felt vulnerable, but I felt more vulnerable because I was, I was just sitting on my computer, uh, writing some, some code, and in my country, some really, some really important things were happening. And I felt, and asked myself, okay, what can I do, right? Um, what, what can I do? And, you know, uh, we are having our own Google today, and people have been talking about Islamophobia and its impact, impact uh, on, our, on the United States and uh, on our communities in the US. And we might be feeling similar. Actually, when I think about myself, people say, um, hey, like, you should vote so that you can have some say on what's going on in the US. Uh, for me, I'm an international, I can't even vote. And when I look at myself, I began sitting on my computer writing some code, and I don't have anything to say on what's going on. Uh, so actually, what's going on, right? Uh, if we, when I when I personally think about this big picture, I feel very um, very disempowered, and I, I think, okay, uh, what can I do? What could I do? Or what did I do when things happen in Turkey? When things happen in the U.S.? These are like two different countries that mean a lot to me. Uh, and I felt that uh, focusing on, on, the, on this big picture and thinking about, okay, the only way how we can improve our countries, the only way how we can really make a change is to wait for these, like, some big names to, like, you know, make some change or, like, show up on Facebook, like, sorry, FaceTime, like, that's what everyone did, because that was, like, an interesting move, uh, and really helpful, or, like, something interesting happening, like, people voting for this person or that person, and that's really, thinking that, that that's going to that, that's gonna be the thing that's going to really change our lives. Definitely things really have some impact on our lives. But when we think, when we only think of this uh, political scene, we really miss the picture, I think. But the only way we can really make a change is to focus on ourselves and our communities. Because that's the only influence we can have. And that's what I realized through these two processes going on, both in Turkey and in the US. Uh, because I felt, okay, I don't have even the, some of the rights people have, which is fine, I'm not complaining about it, but the only thing I can do is to have my community grow so that one day we can be really the people who can have a say on the processes. And, we, and, and only by this way I felt we, we can grow the community, our Muslim community, non-Muslim community, our MIT community, so that we can uh, educate the engineers of the Ummah, the innovators of the Ummah, the doctors of the Ummah, the leaders of the Ummah, the leaders of the United States, the leaders of the Turkey, who can have a say on what's going on, not politically, socially, in terms of education, in terms of culture, in terms of all other dynamics. And that's why we are here. That's why we are here as an MSA. Today, we came together to reflect on our unity, on our engagement, 
on our service, on our values, and on our mission, so that we can, as a community, grow, not only as Muslims, not only as MIT, as the greater Boston area, as the United States, and educate people who can really have a say. Um, thanks a lot, and thanks for being here to be part of this event. Have a great day. So I'd like to start off by saying uh, welcome to the speaker, welcome to MIT, welcome to our full dinner. So we can give a round of applause. Thank you for coming. Uh, I've never met Karu until now, kind of, but uh, I've read plenty of his articles, seen him on major news networks, and listened to his lectures uh, numerous times. So when we, the MSA, were looking for speakers, I suggested he be in the room. And uh, the story following that is a little bit, uh, I'll just go into it. I, I emailed him directly, and I was so anxious about getting a response that I went ahead and copy-pasted my invitation and Facebook messaged him. And some people at the time thought it was very, very unprofessional, uh, talking about the head coordinator of the over here. <laughs> uh, but I, I was just anxious, I wanted a response. So, Bashir and uh, Harun gave me a response on Facebook. Uh, before I got my email, and at 7.27 p.m., and I responded 43 minutes later. And it's not like, I saw it right away. I was open on Facebook. Uh, I probably divided that 43 minutes into 20 minutes of panicking, uh, kind of banter, fan <laughs> uh, uh, regarding this, I probably contacted 15 people, like, what do I do, what do I do? And I sat down at my desk and I was like, you know what, I got a response, I'm going to be very professional. Like, and I was like, do I show them my excitement? No. Be cool, be cool. Like, that's, you know, like, I'm being chill about this. It's not a big deal, like, just respond to you on Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> so, I, I did what I did and I sat down for about 25 minutes and I wrote a very, very uh, response that I thought was quite ample, which was Salam Harun, thank you for the response. <laughs> and uh, you know, I'm serious, so obviously I didn't mess up. <laughs> so uh, now I'm going to get to the introduction. I actually have this piece of paper to do the introduction, not to tell me what to say, but rather to narrow down the things to say. Um, because honestly, if I was going to give a full introduction of the Mashallah Harun, uh, I might give the speech until 9.30, so... <laughs> Harun holds a master's degree from Columbia University in Middle East, South Asian, and African Studies, and he's a PhD candidate at Columbia University. Uh, he's a senior fellow and director of development at the Center of Global Policy. He serves on the board of Multicultural Audience Development Initiative at the Metropolitan Museum, Art, Museum of Art in New York City. He's a columnist at Al Arabiya News, a senior correspondent at religiondispatches.org. He's had his works published in The Guardian, Foreign Policy, Boston Review, Salon, the Salon, the Huffington Post, CNN, Al Jazeera, Don, among many other places, and has repeatedly appeared as a commentator on CNN, BBC, and NPR, among other places. And on top of all that, as if that wasn't enough, he's also an author, having written a novel, The Order of Light, and an upcoming memoir. How to be a Muslim in American story. So, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Haru Bhu. Yeah, I'm like Marco Rubio. <laughs> Same color, too. 
<laughs> Better moral judgment, though. No. <laughs> this is just me looking for a speech to read to you. So, uh, I'm always filled with, so this always surprises people. Um, for someone who speaks publicly, I have tremendous social anxiety. Uh, I'm very nervous in crowds around people, especially new people. Uh, it's always difficult for me to go in front of people and, and talk and think I have something interesting to say. So, uh, this anxiety stretches to every part of my life. Every time I have to use a public restroom, I'm utterly mortified that someone's going to walk in. And most public restrooms have these locks that you can't ever tell are actually locked, right? Because like, when you try to unlock them, they just open because they don't want you to be like an idiot and lock yourself in the bathroom. But then you're sitting there wondering, oh my god, is the door actually locked? Is someone going to come in? So I go into this bathroom in this restaurant, and I'm trying to lock the door and make sure it's locked. And no sooner do I close the door and lock it, but someone knocks on the door. The restaurant's fairly loud, so I have to say loudly, uh, there's someone in here. Five seconds later, they knock louder. So I say more loudly, there's someone in here. Then they knock a third time, really loudly. So not knowing what to do, I just knock back. <laughs> that incidentally is how I do this event. Someone was just trying to go to the bathroom. Leave me alone, right? Like knock, knock back. Then, like five more seconds pass, I'm literally just standing by the door, like, is this person gonna go away or not? And they say, I hear a woman's voice. Alex, are you in there? Hell's <laughs> Alex. <laughs> no, but I am here. Doesn't really answer the question, but whatever. She bends like really frantically. She's like, Alex, are you in there? Alex, who are you in there with? <laughs> and Alex. Something's up. But she already didn't expect this. <laughs> like, the board meeting's gonna be really awkward. Um, just, just, just run away. Go to Canada, probably better after Tuesday anyway. It's not that far, it's like a six hour drive. That's fair enough. So, I was like, I don't know who Alex is. I was like, I'm in here. And she banged me on, she's like, Alex, are you in there? Who's in there? And she's freaking out. So I was like, okay, this bathroom trip is not gonna work. And I opened the door. And not only is there a woman standing there, but like three other people. And it's a small space, but it's New York, right? So like, I'm like literally face to face with her. And she looks at me and she says, you're not Alex. And I said, I know that. <laughs> In conclusion, my name is Marvin. <laughs> Thank you for having me. <laughs> So, you know, the reason I say that is because I grew up in a place where, like, I grew up in Massachusetts and Connecticut, I grew up in New England. And uh, I grew up in a place where years after making my acquaintance and becoming friends with me, many of my peers thought I was black, uh, or Latino, or just had no idea. And that was amazing, because I was like, do you not know, like, how do you not understand any of these things? Uh, I lived in a place where I was the only person with my name. Uh, my name is actually a compromise. Uh, actually, before I say the next part, I'm just going to be, I'm going to be like a little bit of a nice person. Ask anyone here named Iftikhar? Alright, I can make fun of the name then. Uh, that's cool. Uh, so my mom wanted to name you Junaid. I don't know if I look like a Junaid. Um, my dad wanted to name you Iftikhar. Which is terrible, right? Can you imagine going to school in New England with the name Iftikhar, with the letters F, K, and R in that order? Right, when you're the only brown kid. That's just, I mean, either you would become Obama or you would clearly sell the name of me. There's no other, like, there's only two paths for a person named Ifta Bar in New York. like, look like me as a child, like, as a little, like, Star Trek There's nothing else to have. So, uh, I became Maroon. And that was my name, that was the compromise. And it became the source of incredible hilarity and confusion of people. Uh, when I first entered high school, I, uh, I remember you had to walk through the senior wing of lockers to get to the freshman. And when you're 14, 18 year olds are like giants. Right? Like that four year age gap is just like, uh, like it's terrifying. You look at the seniors as if they're gods on earth, right? It's like humans and X Men, right? There's no comparison at all that's possible. So I remember walking through and I'm like, I was a really dirty brown kid with like way too much hair. God has a sense of humor. Um, like, huge <laughs> glasses. I don't know who dressed me, but like, it was whoever did, like, should go to hell. <laughs> um, maybe, it was, maybe it was me, then unfortunately, maybe a little less forceful. 
But the point is, it was absolutely terrible. I looked up like unbelievably ridiculous, and I was the most awkward child in the universe, and then I was named Hardo. So I'm walking through the, the senior wing, and this giant kid, looked like a football player, right? Suddenly, I see him standing directly in front of me. And like the crowd parts, and it's just like me and him in some kind of wild west face off. Right? And I'm like, I'm gonna die. And like, that's, I have not been afraid of death since that moment because I saw death. And he says to me, Are you Haru? Now, I'm the only non white person in this hallway. So it is highly unlikely that I'm not Haru. At the same time, like, I don't want to be Haru at this point. So I said very awkwardly, Yes. And he kind of nodded to himself and he said, that's so cool. As if the fact that my name existed meant there was still magic in the world. <laughs> he incidentally became a Harry Potter fan. <laughs> he was utterly amazed that someone could be named Marvel. I was it. And so throughout like, a lot of high school, I was a little bit of a curiosity. That people would actually be amazed that that could be my name. I had a friend, James. We were friends from sixth grade through the end of high school. And when the Godzilla movie came out in the 90s, like crap movie, it's absolutely horrible. When it came out in the 90s, we went to see it in the theater together. And the cab driver's name was Paro. And James turns to me in the theater, completely serious, like not a shred of satire or sarcasm or, or silliness in his voice, and says, you do have a real name. <laughs> you think my parents just made up a really weird name? And you're like, that was so, it was like really just unsettling to me. I didn't understand what happened. We would have substitute teachers come in, and they would be like, do the, you know, they would go through your names and do attendance. And they'd look around the room, and they'd be like, Haroon, Haroon. And finally, my friend Alex raised his hand and said, seriously, like, you need to ask which one of us is named Haroon. That's a bit awkward, because you can't admit to, like, positive racism, but you kind of can. <laughs> and I carry that going forward. Um, Starbucks is a challenge for me, maybe for some of you. Um, I wanted to be hard of Like, there's a part of you that wants to be like, you will know my name, and you will not define me, because this is not Ellis Island anymore. Right? But then there's a part of you that's like, I want my damn beverage, and I just want to go. And like, I don't want to have an argument over my name. So, for a while, I was blamed, because once I said hard of and the lady heard blame. And I was like, wait, is it okay, Starbucks? It's kind of cool, or like, I have to go with blame. Right? So, for like two years, I was blamed. And I was like, you know what, maybe I want to strike a blow against Islamophobia, which apparently is the topic, right? I don't know. Yeah. Um, is that, that's the topic now? Okay. Yeah, I guess. Okay. Um, Islam, the topic. <laughs> so I became, so I was like, my Starbucks name is going to be Hussein. Because you should know what the middle name of our president is, right? Like, that should not be that hard for you to understand. So my Starbucks name was Hussein, which was amazing, because I tried, I debuted this name, being the genius I am in Miami, where everyone was like, okay, what's it? <laughs> and I said, like, like, every single person, and I came back to New York, and I got, I kid you not, I got sane, as in S-A-N-E, as in love sound mind. Right? You know, they're like sane, and I was like, seriously? But okay, fine. Then I got Karen, and I got Jocelyn. And that's awkward, because like, you know it's your beverage, you just paid $7 for it, you could have had it at home for like 50 cents, right? So you want the damn thing, right? And then question why you just bought something for $7, it's just liquid. Right? You see also Marco Rubio, first story, right? That's where it ends up. <laughs> and there's that party, so you're like, what am I going to do with this? So you know what you do in that situation is you walk up to the barista and you say, I will give it to her. And then you walk out with the beverage. And you look like, you know, you're just there to pass the beverage on. Right? That's your function in the world. Um, yes. I was very proud of myself when I went for Aaron, because that's my name in English. And I got Aaron as an E-R-I-N, which is amazing. Uh, so, if you think that America is too smart to vote for Donald Trump, Starbucks can tell you otherwise. <laughs> but the reason I tell you this is because my name, Harun Hobel, uh, Harun is the Hebrew, and translated into Arabic, Ahaman, right? Aaron, the brother of Moses. And Hobel is Persian for Mongol, and I am not Hebrew, Arab, Persian, or Mongol. But somehow, I have those names. And my name was always a source of curiosity for a lot of people, occasionally humor and frustration. But this is the first time in my life that my name has become a marker of dread. I have no idea what's going to happen on Tuesday. 
I don't think any of us really do. And I know we all say that every election is important, every election is different, and every election is historical. But this one feels particularly crazy. It's been described, sorry, as a, what did I see it as? On Twitter today, as an extinction level event. Uh, I like to call this the serious finale of American civilization. <laughs> Stay tuned to see what happens next. But uh, it's a particularly unsettling time. Uh, I was in Jerusalem, and uh, an Israeli asked me when he found out I was American, he said, what is wrong with you? And I was like, really? And he said, it seems like your country is giving itself an IQ test and losing. Now, <laughs> well, you were at MIT, so you could probably answer better than I could if you can actually lose at an IQ test. But it seems like we are pulling it off. I believe in yourself, you can do anything. And so I asked myself how it is that we got here, and how it is that things have turned so bad. And there's a lot of reasons for how we got here and why we got here. But one of the reasons is Islamophobia. And that's a weird thing to say. Because there are three or four million Muslims, maybe five million Muslims in the entire United States. So out of a population of 330 million people, uh, you know, give or take 11 million who may or may not be deported. That's not a lot of people. Most of us who are Muslim are concentrated in certain areas. It's estimated that uh, about a million Muslims live in the New York City metropolitan area, meaning almost 25%, one out of four Muslims in the world, uh, maybe not the world, the United States, but the World Series, so kind of like the world. <laughs> Go, Cubs. <laughs> Sorry, the wrong city. It's okay, I'm a big kids fan, so we can, we can commiserate over that. Um, one out of four Muslims in the United States lives in the New York City metropolitan area. Uh, largest concentrations of population in places like California, Michigan, Chicago, Houston, right? So we're not spread, shall we say, proportionally across the country. And yet fear of Muslims and discussion of Islam has not just consumed America, but it is corroding America. And that's why uh, you have the title that you have before you. And I don't mean it flippantly or in a silly kind of way that Islamophobia is bad for everyone. Uh, I mean it in a very deep and fundamental sense. That we have, as a country, gone nuts about Islam. And as a result, we have begun to make political and social choices that are consuming the very fabric of our country. It's a Canadian commentator who said, uh, just as Rome was not built in a day, Rome was not burned in a day. And the decisions and the conversations and the directions that our country has been taking recently strike at the very heart of the idea of liberal democracy. The very thing that if you will excuse the expression, makes America great. And so what I want to do here is ask how we got here, why we got here, and how we get out of here. That has to do with the disproportionate response that we have allowed to dominate the American conversation when it comes to many of us in this room. Namely, what is the threat posed by Islam and Muslims to the United States, if any, and why can we not seem to have a reasonable conversation about this? A colleague of mine, a Canadian journalist, remarking on the last year, said, it seems like at the peak of its power, America's decided to stick its head in the toilet and flush. <laughs> he said, I don't understand. On most indicators, America is doing remarkably well. Those challenges the country faces, we should be capable of handling. There's no reason to have a freak out, but it seems like everyone's freaking out. And so that's what I wanted to talk about today. So, with your permission, that was my introduction. Maybe, right? Um, I should do a clip so you can all be done on Saturday. <laughs> also, for Halloween, I just dressed up for myself and I showed up on Tuesday and I said I was also standard time. <laughs> Nobody understood. Some of them were actually scary. It worked. <laughs> Gentleman at my table asked me what I do in the area when I sat down. It's kind of a great question. I was like, I don't do anything in the area. And he kind of looked at me with confusion, and I asked him where the bathroom was. <laughs> I didn't actually, but you can tell me later. What's your name? Hassan. 
Hassan, there you go. Um, I said, well, I'm speaking here, and then uh, Bashir said yes, and then I said, what's the topic? And he laughed and walked away. Still doesn't realize that I was serious. Like, still just trying to get one with the topic. Stop recording me, yeah, say good. I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. I was in New York on 9-11. Uh, I had made the decision to run for president of the Islamic Center, or MSA, uh, at the end of my junior year, which was spring 2001. And so my fourth or fifth day as president of the Islamic Center at NYU was September 11th, 2001. Uh, I was president of the largest Muslim community uh, near Ground Zero, which meant I was thrust as a very awkward 21-year-old who still has backpack attached to him at all times into a spotlight I was not ready for and utterly terrified by. But I did it because I had to. And I remember that in the year after 9-11, conversations were dominated by fear, anxiety, concern, but above all, curiosity. A lot of people wanted to understand what had happened and why. And there was no clear answer explaining what had just happened that could make sense to the average American for whom much of the Middle East and the Muslim world was a mystery, not even on your radar, and suddenly it's on your radar. Islamophobia, however, in the United States is not actually tied to September 11th. It began with the Iraq War, with a decision by the Bush administration to make a case for a war of aggression against a country that had nothing to do with anything. Right? It's as if after Pearl Harbor we decided to invade China. Right? Like, nothing to do with anything. But in order to sell the war, the administration and those who supported the war had to conflate Al-Qaeda and 9-11 with Saddam Hussein and the Ba'ath Party. And they took advantage of what is the necessary precondition for any kind of bias or bigotry. Ignorance. When you don't know something about a people, a culture, or a religion, a nation, or a community, it is easy for someone else to tell you what to think. And because people did not know a lot about Islam and Muslims, they were receptive to whatever arguments might be presented. And the argument that was presented was that the threat of terrorism did not emanate from specific groups or specific regions in which those groups operated, but it was a systemic characteristic of Islam as a culture and a civilization and a religion. And therefore, Afghanistan and Iraq would be tied to each other. And lacking any basis on which to challenge this, we went to war with Iraq. Now, in any reasonable estimation of how that war has gone, we lost. We don't even know what our objectives really were, but on any measure, we failed to achieve them. And the blowback from that war, and the consequences of that war, have created the very thing that we were ostensibly trying to avoid, and cemented in people's minds and opened the door to those factions who benefited from a narrative that Islam was at war with the West. And when you are told that someone is at war with you, it is not only rational, but prudent and reasonable and a good thing to hit back first. Because if your life is in danger, then you need to do whatever you need to do to protect yourself. And so a narrative began to enter the American consciousness in order to justify a war that could not otherwise be justified, that Islam was at war with the West as a totality. And therefore, we were not facing specific threats, but a threat emanating from over a billion and a half people, which required the militarization of our entire society, our politics, our culture, our values, everything about us. We have existed in a state of emergency in a war for over a decade now. It is something that seems to have no end in sight, and it has produced, unsurprisingly, a kind of fascism on the right. Because if you tell people that they face an existential threat, they will respond existentially. If you pump for 15 years bias and bigotry into people's minds, it will have an effect. And this is, mind you, something that extends across the political spectrum, though more so among some candidates than others. But even Jeb Bush, who was one of the more reasonable Republican candidates, called ISIS an existential threat. Now, ISIS is a dangerous movement, but to describe ISIS as an existential threat to the most powerful nation in the world is a bit extreme. 
And yet, if you tell people that, they will begin to believe it. And they will begin to operate in that way. And so here we are. But when I say Islamophobia is bad for everyone, I don't just mean that it has corroded our politics. It has corroded the very stuff out of which our country is made and robbed many of you of your futures. And I don't mean that lightly. In the last 15 years, we have spent trillions of dollars on the war on terror, and it has largely failed. There is more terrorism now than there was before. A basic definition of success or failure is whether the problem is getting worse or better. Right? We're all smart enough to know that. It's estimated that the Iraq War itself cost two trillion dollars. It has led to the deaths of several thousand American soldiers, severely or gravely wounded tens of thousands of American soldiers, led directly or indirectly to the deaths of hundreds of thousands of Iraqis, badly destabilized the Middle East, opened the door to ISIS, and if we are successful in the war against ISIS, which must be fought, then at best we would have in 15 or 20 years basically gone back to where we started. Two trillion dollars. Do you know how much it would cost for every American to go to college for free every year? 70 billion. You're smart, you can do the math. There is a difference between two trillion dollars in a war that makes you and the world less safe and an investment that makes the country more prosperous. There are serious challenges facing the United States in our infrastructure, and energy, and education, and political gridlock, investments in healthcare, in research and innovation, that we are unable to make because we either lack the money or we have diverted the money to other places and other causes. And in that time, in that time, America's competitors have moved forward by leaps and bounds. If you look at any country from China to United Arab Emirates to Saudi Arabia, all across the world, many countries have made huge and necessary investments in their futures that America has been unable to because the language of Islamophobia has caused us to take a turn for the worse. Islamophobia is literally destroying America because it prevents us from having rational conversations about how great the challenges we face are and where they stand in respect to other challenges. Why, for example, in three debates did we have not a single question about climate change and plenty of discussion about ISIS? In the long term, what is the greater challenge to the United States and the rest of the planet? We didn't even debate the question. We have the assumption that terrorism is the only problem America faces or the only grave problem America faces and there can be no other measure or metric of someone's fitness to lead. That is how Islamophobia is destroying the United States. It is robbing you of your future and corrupting this country. Because it is a disproportionate response to a real problem. A problem of extremism. But a disproportionate response, by definition, causes you to make bad decisions and bad investments. Now, many times the challenge I feel in Muslim communities is that we want to respond with how something makes us feel. And there's nothing illegitimate about it, right? How you are made to feel, the pressure you are under, the challenge and the threats to your rights and freedoms are completely legitimate conversation topics and areas of interest and focus, politically, culturally, socially, educationally, what have you, right? That's all good. But in order as a very small minority to talk to the nation at large, we need to change the conversation now more than ever to something bigger than what it is right now. Right? Because if the conversation is constantly framed around your peace of mind and someone's existential security, guess what? You lose. If the conversation is, oh, occasionally someone who looks Muslim gets thrown off the plane, and the response is, well, it's better that you get thrown off the plane than the plane gets blown up, you lose. You don't win a conversation if you can't show people that your rights and freedoms are intimately and directly tied to their rights and freedoms. 
until and unless we make common cause with other communities, which we have not done a very good job of doing so far, we will not see our concerns move anywhere in the public sphere. And by all measures, Islamophobia is getting worse. We now have, within striking distance of the White House, a candidate who basically wants to ban our religion from our country. That is not progress or success on any measure. What has happened to the millions of dollars American Muslims invested in their communities and institutions? How much good has it done? And that's a hard question to ask, and it's not an easy one to confront, but I think we should. Because we should ask ourselves how it is that only two or three points separate someone like him from the White House. And what would happen if he came to power? And the kind of people he would appoint to decide our futures. People like Ayanna Arcieli and Frank Gaffney would become policy advisors. And your rights and freedoms and futures and the fate of many countries in the world would be determined by people like that. So where are we in the political conversation? Where is our influence? Do we matter? That's a hard question. And I'm not here to throw it at you to leave you depressed and miserable and scared. But we should at the very least be rattled. Because this is not the potential of our communities. We can do a lot better than this. And to give you a few ideas how much to end it there, that would be absolutely terrible. I've done my name is Alex. I have a few ideas. They're reasonably good ideas, I think. If they're not, it's fine. We'll see each other in the detention center. It's funny because it's true. The first is, as I said in this talk, that our rights and freedoms are connected to everyone else's. Now, sometimes this manifests itself as anti-Latino sentiment, anti-immigrant sentiment, anti-Mexican sentiment, as structural or personal racism, as anti-black racism, as anti-Muslim sentiment, as anti-Semitism, as misogyny and patriarchy, as homophobia, but it's all basically the same thing. It is people in power, or who wish to remain in a certain kind of power, denying to others what they prescribe for themselves. So I will treat myself with a generosity and an openness that you are denied. So Donald Trump can say at a debate, Muslims should report on terrorists. Nobody asks him why he didn't report on Dylan Stormroof. Because the question is absurd. Because you're white, you know who a white supremacist is? Doesn't make any sense. But that's the conversation about us. You must know where the extremists are. But it's all the same. Sometimes it comes out after us, other times against other communities. There is more open and naked anti-Semitism now in this country than I have, I can even remember. There is more anti-Muslim sentiment, anti-immigrant sentiment, and people talk, oh, you know, after the election, Trump supporters could turn to violence. They are already turning to violence. This is already happening. Right? But it's not just happening to us. And so the rights and the freedoms that have been gained by many people in this country are under threat, not just those of you who are Muslim, who are immigrants, or people of color. It comes for all of us. A hundred years ago, most of us in this room would have no place at the political table. And there's some people who want to take us back in that direction. The second thing, people can't create their own realities. That's important to recognize. Facts matter, but so do emotions. And I'm not saying this because you should make up facts. But when you have a worldview in your head, you can make the world look like your head because of the decisions you make. So people are convinced that ISIS is about to overrun Western civilization when it can barely hold on to its own territory. People have become convinced that the American-Mexican border is basically a scene where ISIS is smuggling tens of thousands of fighters into the country. Right? None of these things are true. And yet when you believe they are true, you act in such a way that you can bring about the very circumstances you are trying to avoid. We need to understand 
that fear is not a rational thing. And until and unless people understand that you hear their concerns, they will not listen to you. <clears throat> Don't say Islam is a religion of peace and assume that that ends the conversation. Because there are a fair amount of Muslims, right, who do not believe that. And the greatest number of victims of these groups are fellow Muslims. Right? That doesn't make it in the news, right? But the people who are fighting ISIS are overwhelmingly Muslim. And the people who are being killed by ISIS are overwhelmingly Muslim. But they are fighting Muslims who believe their religion is war. That's like someone telling you that there's no such thing as white supremacism. Well, obviously there is. Right? We cannot get away with the answers that ignore the very problems people are looking desperately for answers about. Because if it sounds like you are dismissing or ignoring the problem, or minimizing the problem, your answer will never be heard. In order to be in the conversation, you have to hear what is being said before you enter it. That doesn't mean that you can't believe that Islam is a religion of peace. It means you acknowledge how our religion is used by some people, and how that affects other people. And there is no shame in doing that, and no weakness in doing that. A community or a society that loses the ability to criticize itself rapidly declines and implodes. It's a fact. If we can't handle criticism of ourselves internally, we will never solve our problems and reach the potential we have. And finally, we're not alone. And I really want to emphasize that. Today, um, Today was an amazing day. I love days that are like adventures because even when they suck, they're like, at least I have a good story out of it. So, uh, by an Uber driver's name, Muhammad, as most of our Uber drivers are. Um, incidentally, many of you look like Uber drivers. It's okay. Once I made that joke, it sounds like I work for Uber. I was like, you just proved my point. So, that's the I know what that is. So, Muhammad smelled like he eats Nahari for breakfast every morning. And uh, now I smell like I eat Nahari for breakfast every morning. Uh, if you don't know what Nahari smells like, just smell the Pakistan nearest you. It's okay. It's true. It's fine. For Pakistan, you can say that. It's really good. We have awesome food. Why should we be ashamed, right? Like, that's what we eat for our hands. We don't have to have like, utensils because that's because your food sucks. Um, you just need to add all this extra stuff to your food because your food is boring, right? It's not our fault. That's why the British conquered half the planet. They're like, this food is terrible and the weather sucks too. So they're just like, there's gotta be something better than this. There's actually a giant poster in the Bayan Mall like, by this person who's like, the British have the worst food on the planet. That was like a little bit of like, a little bit of shade given colonialism. So, okay, anyone here British? That's awkward. It's okay, where are you anyway? Um, okay, so I told Muhammad when I got in the car that I have to go to the Enterprise rent a car at Newark Airport, because that's where I'm renting my car. So Mama says, okay. I said, I don't know the exact address, but it's at the airport. He said, okay. So Mama drives me to Hertz. Hertz is not Enterprise. <laughs> Mama is like, I brought you to the rental car agency. I was like, I said Enterprise. And he said, well, I don't know where that is. I was like, we had a conversation before the ride started. Like, where is it? And he's like, I don't know where it is. And I'm like, so what are we supposed to do now? He's like, I don't know. We just kind of stood there looking at each other for two minutes. It was amazing. I love Pakistanis. We are awesome people. <laughs> So um, after I then figured out the directions and gave him my phone to navigate, um, I should have thrown, I should just drive the car and like put in like you know, a little bit of forward. So it's good to be in other people's shoes. So I picked up my car and I decided I decided um, that I would stop. My mother is buried in a Muslim cemetery between Massachusetts and Connecticut, right? In a town called Enfield, Connecticut. My mother passed away ten years ago. I grew up right in New England right here. And so uh, you know, I don't drive often from New Jersey because I don't keep Car. So I said I would stop there on the way here. So I stopped there, and you know I, I went, and, and there's a number of people I know who were buried in that cemetery. And you go in, you're talking about you're aware of them. And then as I was getting out of the car, it was a very weird moment for me because I was back home, right? Like I even lived in New England for a very long time, but this is where I grew up. You know, at some level, it speaks to you in a way that you don't even realize. And it was really unsettling to me because Islamophobia is my bread and butter. Or my, I don't know, Gordian on, Gordian on, I don't know. Um, and, you know, I thought about what was happening in the next few days and how weird it was. And I remember growing up being like that weird kid in our room and how much things have changed. And I thought to myself, like, how did I not see any of this coming? Like, could I 
ever imagined this situation happening when I was growing up. When most people didn't even know what ethnic group or religion I was, uh, many of my friends were like, what religion are you? And I'm like, Muslim. They're like, so it's like Protestant or Catholic. <laughs> like, I'd be like, it's a different religion. And they'd be like, what? And like, you know how Jews are not Protestant or Catholic? And they'd be like, no. <laughs> that, was, that was the end of that conversation. <laughs> but like, that was like, that, that was, I, like, I liked that difference. It was a lot safer than, you know, we should send you back to the country and bomb you. Um, it was a little bit more reassuring. And I was talking to a friend of mine, and she said, oh, do you know any people in the area? Because like, I was saying, like, this is a really weird moment for me. And it was really emotional, and I was really overwhelmed. And I said, yeah, like, there's some aunties and uncles I still know in town, and probably around. She's like, why don't you go visit them? And I was like, okay, seriously? I'm very suggestible. Like, you can, you can suggest the dumbest thing in the world to me. Like, you should go get a tear gas. Like, that's a good idea. Like, I will convince myself in five minutes it's a good idea, and then I'll go do that thing. The only thing that did not work was vegetable, amazingly, which is why I'm bankrupt. Um, so, like, I just, I'm an idiot. So, listen to your parents. I got that point in, so the uncle's not just calm down. And so I was like, yeah, maybe I should go visit this auntie and uncle that I grew up with. Incidentally, if you're not South Asian, auntie and uncle is a term for an elder who is not related to you. <laughs> which is really weird, but that's the term, right? So it's like they're not, they're not actually related to you as far as they're all actually related. Um, but like, we don't know how we're related, right? So it's like, until we determine the actual nature of the relationship that we have to each other, you're just an auntie and <laughs> So this auntie and uncle, um, amazingly, when I was growing up, um, my father and this uncle had the exact same Toyota language. Um, like, there were only two Toyota languages in the entire town, and we had the two of them, and they were the exact same color scheme, right? And both my mom and this auntie wore headscarves, which must have confused the hell out of the white people. Because they were like, yeah, like, they all look the same, and they have the same car. Like, they were like, that's just cruel, right? Like, first you can't tell a car that you have the same car. It's a disaster. It's also impossible to sneak out of anywhere, because anyone knew, like, that was your car. Um, not that I would ever sneak out. I only went to the Muslim. Um, <laughs> so, uh, it's okay, I'll let first of all. Um, so, anyway, I called this auntie and I said, this is amazing. I called her and I said, are you home? And she's like, you just called me home. I was like, yes, I did. Are you free? And she's like, yeah, why? And I said, oh, I actually wanted to stop by. And she's like, when? It was like, like four minutes. And she's like, oh, okay, yeah, sure, you should come. She's like, oh, your brother just left. And I was like, he did? And I was like, yes, he did. Like, literally, I had no idea. Somehow my brother was in Connecticut, too. For completely different reasons, he lives in New York, like, an hour away from me. I had no idea. He actually visited Connecticut for another reason. So now I know the double idiot. One for calling her at home and asking if she's at home. And then, because I don't even know my brother was just at her house. So she's like, yeah, no, by all means, come. And so I went to their house, and, and I saw, you know, their family members. And... We hung out. I hadn't been to their house in eight years. Uh, I had not seen them in three or four years. Uh, I met, um, I was best friends growing up with her son. Um, I met uh, her other son and one of her daughters, and now it's two kids. So it was nice. It was a nice trip. And we spent the entire 45 minutes talking about Donald Trump. It's all they wanted to talk about. They were like, clearly, like, you know, they had a lot they wanted to get off their chest, right? So I think a lot of them. And that's what I wanted to end with. Um, that you should call aunties and uncles and this and that. <laughs> because it makes you feel better, it makes them feel better. But it's that we're not actually alone. And that's really important. That sometimes it feels like you're being torn in half. Because we are being told that there is no room for hyphenated identities. That you can't be American and Muslim, or you can't be Pakistani and Western, or you can't be Egyptian and North American, or what have you. Right? There's no room for that. And that uh, who you are as a person, the different parts of you have to be torn apart. And if these different things are you, then literally the only apparent option you have is to tear yourself apart. And you can't do it. And so we are existing in a situation of extreme stress, anxiety, and fear. This is not an easy time. And it's probably going to get out of here. And that means that all of you have to take care of yourselves and each other. We spend a lot of time in our communities fighting each other over stupid crap. You know, are you Sunni, or Shia, or are you conservative, or are you liberal, blah, 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 right? We fight over all this stuff, and we miss the much bigger stuff. And we are facing a common threat, <coughs> and we are not alone in facing this common threat. That there are a lot of other communities and people who are also threatened. 
And so long as we are united in this, we have strength. That means we have to be united internally and externally. I don't mean united in a stupid, naive way, like, oh, like, let's just all be Muslims and that will solve our problems. Right? Like, we are different, we're always going to be different. It means accepting our differences, acknowledging our differences, and learning where we can work together and how we can work together. And that's your job going forward. You have to build communities that look after the people who are vulnerable, that fight for the rights of people who can't fight for their own rights, and direct their resources to protecting people and advancing those protections. You have to demand protection for yourself and demand protection for others. And that cannot be on the basis of who people are, but simply on the fact that they are people. And I think we will do it. I think it's going to be a hard road and a tough road, and it's going to be a depressing road, but we will pull it off. You have immense talent in your community. You have immense potential in your community. Don't let it go to waste. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum.
right? The overwhelming majority of the world's refugees are Muslims. What do we want to do about that? Like, we should be able to answer our own problems. Does that make sense? I know it's like really awkward, so I have to like stand up there while I'm talking to you. It's kind of weird. But you can talk time, it's fine. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Awesome. Also, um, I don't work out, I just naturally. It's fine. In case you're wondering. <laughs> Probably not. But in case you are. Hi. Thank you so hey. much for the talk. This was very inspiring, and I'm sure everybody has new ideas and new things to think about. Uh, my name is Amir, and I'm Palestinian, and I wanted to ask what your thoughts on the Israeli Palestinian conflict now is. Thoughts so on the conflict now is? Oh man, that's a loaded question. Um, no. Uh, I would say two things, and I hope it doesn't. Maybe I should make my question more specific. Mm -hmm. um, in what ways do you think Palestinian communities can make uh, a better situation for themselves given that the conflict is happening and there doesn't seem to be a clear solution in the, in the foreseeable future? Yeah. Um, so the first thing I would say is that you know, in the United States, we obviously face a climate of Islamophobia that is immediately threatening to us oh. in this circumstance. Um, but that Islamophobia feeds into and is fed into by foreign policy, right? The two are interrelated. Um, the more organized we are against anti-Muslim sentiment and the dehumanization of Muslims in our domestic circumstance, the more impact we have on policy. Look, I know that I'm talking immediately right now about threats we face. Um, we are still, as Americans or people who live and work in America, um, we still have access to power far beyond what most people in the world do. And I would think it a shame if we don't get more involved in politics. I know there is a trend in Muslim communities to be like, oh, Clinton and Trump are all the same. We're just going to check out for politics. I think that's grossly irresponsible. Uh, I think that it is possible to be engaged in the public sphere and remain moral and true to your convictions, right? Um, that's different from saying you have to make compromises, but we need to be in the room where important conversations happen to shape policy outcomes. That doesn't mean we can solve Israel Palestine, right? Itself. But it does mean that we can change the conversation in American foreign policy as to where our resources, our tax dollars go. And if that begins with ending the dehumanization of Palestinians and other Muslims, as it does any other population in the world, right? It's only easy to support the occupation of a people if you think those people are fundamentally violent, right? The minute you humanize the population, and don't underestimate that, I think sometimes people dismiss it like, oh, culture, music, food, that doesn't do anything. It does a lot. Right? If you look at the progress other communities have made, cultural progress is enormous. When people can eat your food and listen to your music and watch your movies, right, they begin to see you not just as human beings, but as people they like and want to emulate. And that fundamentally transforms things. So, I mean, there's policy discussions, there's cultural production, there's music, there's 10,000 things people can do. Um, and I think the urgency is significant. Um, one of the things I've seen in Muslim communities, and I don't want to kind of you know, take too much time on this, is that we assume that sort of people in power are always more left ones. Sometimes I hear this like that, you know, they're just out to get us, right? That they're in, intrinsically opposed to Islam. The reality is that America as a society is like any other society, and people in power sometimes are just as stupid as we are, right? Like they're not, I mean, I remember the first time I was in a policy discussion in DC, and it was this like horrifying moment when I was like, oh my God, what am I doing at this table? Everyone's gonna realize I'm a fraud. Right? Because, like, who the hell am I at this table? And then followed by, like, oh my god, everyone here is as dumb as me. And then followed by, oh my god, they're actually as dumb as me, right? <laughs> the only difference is that they have a lot of power. So their ignorance is led to greater power, right? Imagine if, like, you're, like, the average Muslim community institution like, had nuclear weapons. It would be amazing, right? Like, and I'm not saying this flippantly, right? People ultimately are products of their circumstances. So, you know, to give you an example, um, I was working in DC on early stage Iran deal negotiations. And there was a guy in the room who was very anti-Iran deal um, and very hawkish on Israel, right? A very right-wing pro-Israel. And he was basically saying that we should just go to war with Iran. And I was kind of like, I think that's a bad idea, right? For many reasons. And you know, I thought I had, pardon the expression, a Trump card, where I thought I had like the best possible counter argument. And I said, um, if you invade Iran. Given America's disproportionate military advantage, the Iranian government would probably collapse very quickly, and you could have an Iraq scenario, right? And the government collapses, and you have civil wars, you have sectarianism, and violence, so on and so forth, and hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of people would die, 
Given that Iran is three times the size physically and, and, and demographically of Iraq, it would be even worse. And he literally looked at me straight in the face and he said, I'm okay with that. I was like, well, there goes my argument. <laughs> I was like, well, now that you're okay with mass murder, I, mean, I guess we don't have much common ground to have a discussion on, right? But at that moment, I realized a few things. One was that when you check out the political process, like these decisions are happening right now. Right, so it's like, oh, I don't want to get my hands dirty, or like Clinton is the lesser of two evils nonsense. Like, I can't buy that. Because like decisions are being made that will impact people's lives in ways that we can't even imagine. Because we have the relative privilege of living here so far and remarkable security and prosperity. Right? So pretending like we're too good for this stuff is just a kind of arrogance, right? So don't ever give into that, please. Right? Like throw in and be part of the conversation. The second thing is, you know, then I then I realized I said, you know, if, if you're on collapses, right, this is the kind of cycle. You would have like basically a region with no sovereignty from like the Afghan Pakistan border to southern Lebanon. It's like, where do you think all those radical groups are going to go? And he was really quiet, like he never thought about this. But it was amazing. Like, I was like, you have never even thought for two minutes about what would after the Iraq War, what would happen if the Iranian regime collapsed? Like, how can you actually have a conversation about a war? without thinking through the consequences. And it happens. And so sometimes just being in the room is valuable because it not only reminds people of the humanity of your perspective, but it basically provokes people to think of things they wouldn't have thought of otherwise. And so, you know, what we can do here is to be more involved in organizing those conversations. And each of us, I think, at that point, the question you asked, each of us will find a different niche to work in, or shape, or influence, or donate to, or what have you. Um, but all of those will have the same effect, which is to introduce some humanity into the conversation, and you're right. I think at the moment the conflict is, is pretty depressing, and it doesn't look like it lends itself to an immediate solution. Um, but hopefully, you know, we can make progress towards that and contribute in some way. I hope I answered your question. Thank you. Uh, we're going to take two more questions and just make them quick. Make them quick, make them good. <laughs> and make them a flip too. Make it like 30 minutes. <laughs> just like, then yell it the whole time. Hi, how are you? Uh, my name is Hassan, I'm from Pakistani. Um, heard about what you said, but you will read most of it. Do uh, you have people like you, Hassan Abbas, Wadi Nasser, we're talking to the policy makers in Congress, in DC, but how do we mobilize the Muslims that are scared to go in the US and try to make them police force to connect it with, not only politically, but in the policy makers? That's how it is. Thank you. How do we organize this politically? Um, threat of deportation seems to be working. Um, sometimes they do it for us. No, I mean, realistically, sometimes I think we, we exaggerate how much it takes. I'll give you a simple example. Um, I helped to organize a conference in the United Nations back in April. And we invited basically every member of the New York and New Jersey congressional delegation. Just like a nice letter on letterhead and so on and so forth. Uh, Chuck Schumer attended. Uh, City Council Speaker from New York attended. You know, number of senior officials. The amazing thing is that everyone's office responded to the letter. Like, they may have never heard of us, and yet sending a simple letter with a respectful invitation to be part of the discussion received a response. That was the amazing thing. I was like, wow, that was easier than I expected. Um, you know, politicians respond to money and to attention. And that's just how the system works. Like, it doesn't have any morality play, it's, but it's, just, it's a strategic reality. Um, <laughs> donating to candidates, voting, paying, I mean, all these simple things, and then building them out, right? So, when you, if you elect someone, make sure everyone knows that you elected that person, right? Make sure they remember what you did. And then hold their feet to the fire, right? Like, I am voting for Hillary Clinton, right? But that doesn't mean I approve of all of her policies or agree with all of her policies, right? It means that I want her to win. Um, that's my personal opinion, it doesn't have to be yours. You can be wrong, it's okay. Um, <laughs> you know, it's fine, I mean, the elect created you with free will. So, um, you know, but it means that, you know, if, Inshallah, the best candidate is elected and she becomes president, then we would reach a point, see what I did there? Um, we would reach a point where, okay, now she's elected, but then you have to hold that person accountable, right? And that means having concrete goals. And so a simple, a simple example in New York, and, and I don't want to take too much of your time because I know the brothers getting restless. Um, it's okay, it's fine. I have to use the bathroom too. <laughs> also, this is a very eligible bachelor here, ladies. Um, are you a eligible bachelor? That's <laughs> a
and understand the, the common bases of these challenges, they are forced to reckon with each other as complicated people. And they're forced to build forms of cooperation with each other on common challenges. That is enough to begin to then talk about the more challenging things. But there has to be some basis for why I want to work with you. And in the context of Muslim community institutions, one thing I've seen that's often failed, and this is maybe like a little bit narrow, so I apologize for the audience if it's not relevant. A lot of PLLs will reach out to MSAs and invite them for dialogue without realizing the asymmetry of the relationship. So Hillel's tend to be massively funded institutionalized spaces, and MSAs tend to be student clubs. And so to have a conversation about challenging topics where one party appears to like, have all the power creates an immediate feeling of insecurity in one side that prevents the conversation from going anywhere. Because you don't feel like your interests are being adequately represented. Whether fairly or not, I'm not saying it's fair, it's just a psychological response. And so finding facilitators for those conversations or finding venues do not provoke one side to feel anxious or insecure is really important. And I think a lot of times, I don't think those invitations are extended out of any sort of ill intention. I think they're extended out of good intentions, but they, people don't necessarily realize how they're going process because sometimes it's hard to sit in someone else's shoes. Um, that said, I think, you know, in, in the US and in, in Canada and Europe, we've, our communities face a lot of common challenges, and it would be a real disgrace if you know, we were not able to at least have productive conversations and relationships um, on these issues while agreeing to disagree. And that's for sure democracy. We may not agree on every issue, but we can agree on certain issues and respect each other's rights and humanity. And I think that's the beginning of a positive conversation. I hope that answers your question. Um, also, eligible bachelor, everyone. Thank you. He's not actually married. Thank you very much for your attention. I apologize for being here. Um, so, yeah, thank you very much for being here for this uh, great discussion. And uh, keep me sticking around. Yeah. I know. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so you please approach it later on. Uh, so, keeping up with the. Uh, MIT spirit of engineering and innovation, and like, to be honest, our limited budget. Uh, we later cut a uh, plate for Harun uh, to thank him for coming here tonight and being our guest speaker. So uh, let's post for the camera. <laughs>
I really have not much to say. I just want to keep it short and ask. Is this man a joke? I said I love you, man. I said I love you. No, but seriously, I want to keep it short so that you can actually digest what we're saying and actually do something when you leave this room. When you leave this room, I want you to believe that you are an American. Accept that fact, because it is a fact. And then after, Jeshmi, what did you say? <laughs> Jeshmi, you're American too, come on, you can be. Um, but no, seriously, accept that fact, understand that, and use that information to spark up political conversations. Not be afraid to engage in deep discussions and share your knowledge. Bring our struggle to the table. Make sure that it is heard and that it is affected, that it is changed, that we can make progress. So that's really all I gotta say. Uh, yeah.
go we're way beyond that point that right now we're asking ourselves, well we have five events in one weekend, how do we make sure that you know we're catering them to uh, a wider audience to Muslims and non-Muslims alike so we can be part of the discussions and conversations that are taking place on campus. And uh, so over the next semesters, uh, me and FA will always be in the background working there, uh, making sure that the MSA is growing. But what I really wanted to uh, say to you guys today is that as MIT, uh, as the MIT MSA it becomes a central part of the MIT community, we want you guys to take initiative and become more involved in, the, in growing the MSA and growing uh, everyone around, around campus. And so elections, not the presidential elections, but the MIT MSA elections, uh, are coming up soon, so stay on the lookout for that. And we encourage you all to be engaged in the process. And yeah, again, thanks to everyone that has saying worked hard for making uh, this event happen. Special thanks to Bashir and Fayed for uh, oh, organizing everything. Yeah. And uh, at the end, we're just going to take There will also be a photo uh, towards the end over here, so feel free to take part of that. And uh, yeah, again, I'd like to thank you all for coming here tonight. And uh, we have a suggested donation of five dollars, as you guys said, to help us keep up with this yeah. current trend of uh, holding hopefully great events. And uh, before I wrap everything up, I, would, uh, I just wanted to send thanks to uh, Sister Huda and Brother Samir, uh, who are our co chaplains. Uh, Brother Samir actually joined us recently. Um, and they, they work tirelessly to make sure that there is someone who we can talk to when we are facing pro the problems. And it's their part time job, and they do it for um, basically for free. So, uh, thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, Sister Huda. So, yeah, please stop by, talk to them, uh, talk to members of the EC to know how you can be more involved. Um, thank you very much for coming here. Good night, and the Salah Alaikum.